It's right here, Diane. We have the clicker. Well, we're going to pass it down the line. It's part of the sustainability initiative. <laughs> Ready? Set. Right. Yep. Uh, I went out to dinner last night with some of my friends who are here. We went to a bar because it was supposed to have country music and line dancing. And we sat there an hour drinking better than average whiskey. That's the good part. Bad part is the band for one hour sat there saying, check, 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 <laughs> mic, mic up. No, no, uh, check, check. Then they went out, they had a cigarette. They came back, check, 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 check. So <laughs> I promise you all, we're going to start right here and right now. Um, this is the sustainability challenges and opportunities for craft businesses panel discussion. If you're here because you want to be on this stage with us, hooray, thank you, thank you for coming. If you're here because you've heard about sustainability and you want to bring that more into your shop or into your business, you're going to get some great tips from these industry leaders. If you're here because you're sustainability curious, you don't have to raise your hand or admit to that, but we'll help you see how valuable this can be in, in reaching new markets and becoming a, a more intimate part of your community. And if you're here because you saw some empty chairs and they're so hard to find on the show floor, <laughs> that's okay too. Stay in the chair, there, there's still a few, a few empty. So with that, I think we're good to go. And let me just uh, tell you a little about what we hope to cover in the next hour and who I've got here with me who are fabulous to help us cover it. So what we want to really talk about are some shared lessons. So you've been on a journey, each of my panelists on a journey, and they want to tell you what you've, they've learned so that you may find something you could apply. Uh, we'd also like to make sure there was plenty of time for you to ask questions, assuming you're not just in that chair because it felt good, that you may be curious and want to ask some questions like, how can you find which niche might be right for you? How, where would you go to find and make local connections? What are some hints for communicating about what you've been doing with your customers? And what are some things you could be asking your vendors? What could you be asking them for? So let's jump in. I'm Mary Jean. I own Bat and Kill Fibers in Greenwich, New York. We're a spinning mill. I started the business in 2009 not really sure if sustainability or local farm to fiber where that was going and as we all now know it has taken taken off and um, i'm really fortunate to have been part of that that movement as it's as it's grown um, let me just tell you a little about who's who's here with me i'm going to just tell you them in that that order so you can can know who's who um, right here next to me is Jeannie carver who's from Oregon. Um, Jeannie's a farmer, a rancher, a brand. Um, she launched the Shanico Wool Company in 2018 to scale the supply of responsible wool standard certified wool produced in the U.S. And Shanico is the only supply of U.S. wool meeting third-party audited RWS and native regen global standards for sheep and wool production. And you'll hear way more about all of this and why that is is so so important. Um, I do just want to jump to tell you that um, in early 2020, she launched a carbon initiative, which I, I do hope she'll share more about as well, to measure ecosystem and climate impacts, to measure ecosystem and climate impacts on a group of 10 ranches that are now part of the Shanika Wool Company. And the early results are impressive. And most recently, she won a big award. In January, um, she won the um, Sheep Industry Association Innovation Award, which is fabulous. She's the co-author of Stories of Fashion, Textiles in Place, Evolving Supply, Sustainable Supply Chains with her co-author, Dr. Leslie Davis Burns. So next. We have Peggy Ellers, whose business is called Nuno Knits, and she's a fellow New Yorker, but from the Long Island part of New York, designer, maker, educator. In a world of mass-produced fashion, Peggy's really turned back the clock to a simpler time when nature 
was the source of beauty and style. She has decades of experience sourcing natural fibers for farm to fashion and promoting this trend. Her respect for the natural supply chain has inspired the creation of this business, Nuna, a Native American term meaning of the land. She has 30 plus years in the industry with branding, product development, knit, package construction, knitting, hand spinning, a millinery, as we can see that amazing hat, and, and teaching, um, so much more to come. She was an exhibitor, I don't know on that hat, but some hat in 2020 at London Hat Week. New York State Council on the Arts has granted her funding to be a teaching artist and, and so much, so much more. Um, next to Peggy, um, we have um, my friend and neighbor, Cecilia. How did I do? Uh, she, good. Her friends do call her Cece, but she told me she's Cecilia. Cecilia Takchak, um, who's here at H&H at &H with her own booth for the first time in her own new brand called American, um, American U Yarn. American U Yarn, uh, which is all, <coughs> genies, all genies wool. Um, it comes in 24 tonals. So it's uh, RWS certified Shanico Ranch wool. Um, I, I've known her since tw 2015 when she started her business uh, using all local wool, making dog beds from wool, and then later pillow inserts. Of course, I've known Cece forever as one of my customers. She's a farmer with 70 plus Jacob's sheep. In addition, she now owns two stores, a yarn shop and a weaving studio in Albany, in New York State's capital region, Gilderland, New York. And because she's from the capital region, she was originally a policy analyst and lobbyist, and also a former New York State Senator. Um, she brings all of this background to a project that's near and dear to me that called the Hudson Valley Textile Project, which is a nonprofit supply chain connecting group, which she's on the advisory council and she was also a huge advocate for a first in the nation piece of legislation that maybe we'll get to touch on called the New York Textile Act that actually directs Empire State Development to work all along the supply chain to address um, the needs of a growing, re returning textile industry in our state. And, and finally, we have Diane Browning from Appalachian Baby Design a brand based in, in West Virginia and here on the, on the show floor and supplier of the yarn that I'm now knitting for my seventh grandchild's new sweater, except no substitutes. Um, her brand has really worked hard to source organic cotton, which for my grandbabies and others is important, and also now Shanika Wool. So we're all kind of connected <laughs> here from U.S. farms as well as using family-owned small U.S. textile mills um, to spin dye and twist their yarn for the whole craft market. And Diane's going to tell us a little about how this is getting harder and harder to do um, as our industry keeps downsizing and continuing to move offshore, although hopefully what we're all up to here is going to help reshore or, or redefine what's happening. So I've, I've told you a lot about them, but I think it was important for you to know who was here. Uh, I've asked them to, to give us a brief overview of what does sustainability mean to them and why does it matter? And you're going to hear quite a few different perspectives. And then we're going to circle back and um, ask another question in just a little bit. But Jeannie, can you kick it off on that, on that for us? They will. Our friends in the booth will make sure. Wait, I have sound check. Yeah. I don't think it's on. I don't think your microphone's on. Am not on? No. Am I supposed to turn something on? Because you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. I sat on it. Maybe I don't need a microphone. I'm used to the outdoors. Hey, you go, girl. In fact, I could have helped you last night with your line dancing. You can take it up right here. <laughs> <laughs> she wore the right shoes. Yeah. <laughs> I could even sing. <laughs> oh, Jeannie. If all else fails, we, we will sing for you. Um. Check, check, check. Okay. Okay. No, it's not okay. Can you hear me? Check, check. And then Can really? you hear me? No, that's so, no. I know, we're very limited. Give you the mic. How about this? 
I could take this thing off of me and hand it to you. The They're going to give you a mic. Oh, perfect. Okay, is that better? There you go. Yeah. All right, perfect. I've got some notes because I can't go off on any tangents. No, you can't. No, I cannot. For more than uh, 35 years, we've been in the camp of sustainability as ranchers. Our family ranch in the Oregon high desert um, is in our 152nd year. My family ranch is the Imperial Stock Ranch. But I also built a yarn business with our wool named for our ranch beginning in 1999. For almost 20 years um, before I sold that to become my husband's caregiver and then I launched Shanico Wool Company in 2018 um, to, to lead scaling wool in the United States that meets the leading global standard. There's always been three pillars to sustainability and I'm sure you're probably familiar with that. Environmentally, socially and economically responsible. So we work to reduce our negative environmental impacts and our positive environmental um, effects. <clears throat> we also have to be careful about cultures, and that's something that's taking a huge hit in the global offshoring. It's, it's, almost dimin it's diminished traditional skills, and those of you in this event are evidence of the importance of preserving those in every country and every culture around the world. And then, of course, we must be economically viable in order to continue to do great work. So how do you go from, I'm going to simplify because we have such a short time, how do you go from perhaps the mainstream industrialized to conscientious? I'll use those words. First, you simply begin, and it always begins with a mindset change. And then you may start making steps to improve your footprint, and ultimately, where we are today, you invest in the measurement, calculating of your impact in order to reduce that. So the, the probably the first thing that, did that work? Yeah. yeah. The first thing that I can tell you from a sustainability and regenerative perspective is to know where the products come from. Traceability and full transparency are really key. In the fashion and textile industry today, there are many, many brands who do not know where their products are made. And it's impossible for you to take responsibility and prove the conditions in which your products are made if you don't know that trail. So as a first step, and with some coming regulation, companies will be required to map supply chains. Unfortunately, the cheap alternatives that have flooded our markets in recent decades are not represented by the true cost to our communities, our countries, our cultures, and this planet. So some of the goals of how you can improve impacts are to be choosing natural fibers over synthetics. Today, 60% of the apparel um, merchandise made is synthetic. So that's an oil-based trail across all of those products. Mm -hmm. Choose fibers that have an improved environmental footprint. Dig behind the messaging. Uh, ask questions of claims, ask for evidence in support of those claims. Documentation today provides the truth to messages and claims in the market. Ask a lot of questions and ask for full transparency because you can normally recognize authenticity. It will come forth. Use fibers that carry a third party foot uh, stand, a third party audited certification when possible. This is increasing rapidly in the apparel and fashion sector, textile sector, and it will follow in yarn. In fact, it led first in food. It was about 30 years later that fashion and textiles started to get involved. And yarn, it will be there. These third-party standards increase your assurance, increase credibility, decrease, decrease the risk, risk of land degradation, of poor animal treatment or poor animal living conditions, of worker welfare and pay issues, and negative cultural impacts. These third-party audited standards build confidence for you, for our supply chain partners, for your customer, and they increase purpose and build community. You become stakeholders together in the great work at the origins of fiber. We meet 270 criteria to be responsible wool standard 
certified in land, animal, and worker care at the farm ranch level. These are very comprehensive annual audits, and every step in the process, I know we have some folks in the audience who are part of that supply chain, and every step from the ranch through to if you touch it and the consumer touches it is audited at the scouring mill, at the, at the spinning stage, dye stage, <laughs> reconciliation of volumes, third-party organizations audit us to ensure confidence and credibility. And finally, measurement. When you can get to this point in your business, this is our family ranch in Oregon, 50, 50 square miles of high desert. We haven't seen eight inches of rain in five years. But in 20, you can see the green bars, 20, 21, and 22, we are on a net basis capturing 60,000 tons of carbon a year into our soils while delivering beef, lamb, wool, grain, and hay in support of the human community. Our net impact is the greatest single deliverable we do, and up until I began measuring it, it was never measured. We never got credit for it, and it's the greatest single value that we bring. So, measurement is showing up, and it will one day lead our industry beyond standards. It brings brands home. Today, this information is bringing brands home to us for the first time in decades, and that's a good thing for every community in this country. So um, today it's all about regenerative. People like to think that goes beyond sustainability. I'm not so sure. Since the 1980s, we've been leading in this arena on our family ranch. At the farm ranch level where fibers are produced, where they originate, there's a huge potential for environmental impact, both positive and negative. So ask questions of, your, of the fibers in your products in your stores and businesses, and seek to find those fibers who make a posi positive impact because that means we're all part of the community working for nature positive. Thank you. Thank you. You can, uh, I think, I don't know. Can, will yeah. your mic work? I think you can, can hear me, right? Yeah, you can okay, hear me. Okay, you don't need Hi, everybody. You, you don't need the I don't need that. Hold it and turn it off, maybe. So my name's Peggy Ehlers. I'm from Eastern Long Island. And um, I'm a um, yarn designer, um, spinning designer, uh, hat maker, and knitwear designer. Um, I started Nuna, which means of the land and Native Americans. So if, the, if you don't have good dirt, you don't raise good plants, and you don't raise good wool. And I coined this phrase, you know, design that begins with the land. So in all things, when it comes to what I do, if you look at the pictures, it's all different wools. You need to advance your own slide. Oh, I do? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do you do that? Just to the right. Oh, just to the right. There you go. Okay. Sorry. There you are. Okay. So that piece up there is a vintage Pendleton blanket that I turned into a cape that was mm -hmm. from 1950. Um, so this slide here is an array of all the things that I make. So it's hand spun, it's leather, it's mohair, probably 20 different breeds of sheep in there. Um, I developed a wool wash that is completely organic, that is wonderful, that has no petrochemicals in them. I um, have socks made from a local mill in the United States here. They date back to uh, a family in Orient Point where I'm from, 1635. So it's really great stuff. Um, and spinning in public, I do a lot of that. And um, it sort of like brings it to life as far as people are concerned, where they can actually see natural fibers, whether it's cashmere, wool, silk, and the finity. So I really specialize in filament yarn that you could actually put into production. And um, it's important to note that the whole farm to fashion. So if you, you look at that, it's, it's quite amazing that it is farm to fashion and everything in here is farm to fashion. So we just have to be proficient, wonderful knitters, which you guys all are. Um, and then from that part comes the industrialized part. So yeah. So here we have your um, slub yarns, your silk yarns, merino, you have border leister, fin, raccoon, uh, not raccoon, fin sheep, and um, all the sheep breeds that create all the different things that we can buy, and it's in our upholstery, it's in 
uh, our carpets. It's actually being used in insulation now in homes. It's, it's used for everything, which a lot of people don't know. Um, and then from here, it's, it's, again, the same thing, where you take, um, I use negative space as an, um, an idea of how to make garments. So negative space, meaning your body. So how does it look on your body? How does the wool drape on your body? Is it worn? What's the micron on it? How is it made, spun, dyed? And then um, this was an interesting, We're just about out of time. Sorry. I want to get to this. I can't find it. Well, so <clears throat> what launched new, and I'll just say it out loud. Um, so when we talk about sustainability, the thing that created the business was in 2009 when I um, received a NISCA grant. And I taught children the world's economy. And this is what launched it. Thank you. Thank you. You see, um, your slides will appear. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Uh, if I go, there we go. This is Little Moo. <coughs> Little Moo is my bottle fed lamb. We raise Jacob's sheep. We've been doing it for probably 25 years, and we love raising sheep. To bring the wool from this beautiful fiber to my shop is cost prohibitive because it's done on such a small scale. And, but I love raising the sheep. And people want to know where their wool comes from. This is Little Moo in our shop. And uh, this is Little Moo <laughs> shopping in my yarn shop. And this is Little Moo <laughs> hugging a customer. People want to connect <coughs> with their yarn and in my shop, I can bring a sheep in. There's not many yarn shops that can do that. But that, to me, is sustainable. You know where the fiber's coming from. You can feel good that they're being raised well, that the workers are not being taken advantage of, although my son will tell you otherwise. <laughs> but it's, it's important that you understand the process. And because I've been able to create yarn on a small scale, I understand the process and how difficult it is to find local mills. So first of all, I want to thank G.D. Carver, G. Carver and Batten Gill Fiber because without them, I couldn't do what I'm doing now here at the exhibit hall. But so I'll get to that. But first of all, thank you for these women leading the way to say we don't have enough mills. There aren't enough mills to process on a small scale our farm fibers. And you know we needed someone to see the future and how we can make that change and create more efficiency so we can get really good fiber from the US back into production at mills, like Meridian Millhouse, which is spinning yarn for us, for Shaniko, and get it in your hands. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's starting small, but we're building it. And I got to say, there's a lot of women involved pushing that envelope, and I, I think we should recognize that. Um, so when Mary Jean mentioned I was a senator, and uh, so my fiber activities is more towards the latter part of my career. But as a senator, I represented a five-county area, and because I was also a sheep farmer, whenever I came across another sheep farmer, we you know, bonded right away, and we would, I would always say, what do you do with all the wool? And most farmers were throwing it away, which really disturbed me, because this is, wool is amazing, is an amazing fiber, and here's a resource that you have on your farm, and farms are struggling to pay the rent, to pay, pay their bills. Here's a resource that we should be using, and we're not, essentially. So after politics, I decided to start a new career and to do something with that wool that is getting discarded. Not every wool needs to be spun into yarn. You may not like it, but it's still a good resource. So I started, it's a little hard to see, um, a pet bed company because I had a coonhound mix who was freezing in the house. 
because he didn't have a lot of hair. And I had a dog bed that was polyester filled and it was doing nothing for him. And I have wool and I have sheep. So I made a dog bed for him. And, and when he laid on it, he was like, you could see he was visibly more comfortable. Even the cat started sleeping with him. And I was convinced <laughs> I'm onto something. So I started making dog beds filled with wool from local farms and we used a developmental disability work center to do the sewing and we now send wool filled dog beds all over the country and we're you know we keep growing then um i mean have you ever slept on a wool pillow it's amazing do you know that dust mites don't like wool that's a whole nother story but wool helps you be more comfortable you sleep longer more soundly and it's natural it's not uh, going to find its way into a landfill and be there for forever. So we decided to make, start making wool-filled pillows. When you talk about sustainability, um, I'm making yarn with Shaniko wool. I thought, well, what's happening with the stuff that's coming out of the carter as it's getting processed in the mill? Well, I found out not much. Um, and I got a bale of Shaniko wool fiber that falls out of the carter and I used our local uh, batting mill to card it up for me and make these really poofy clouds and we put it into pillows. So we're making pillows with our yarn waste. We don't need to let this stuff go to waste. There's lots of opportunities to use and develop products with, with wool. So if you're a yarn shop, and, and I am a yarn shop, one of the things we get all the time is Where's your local wool when people come in to visit? You know, what, what is, I want local, especially if you're getting people who are visiting. So I happen to, oh, there it is. Where's Andrea? Wave. Andrea is from Columbus, and she is a yarn shop owner. And what Andrea is doing is collecting fleeces from local farms, sending it to Battenkill Fiber, turning it into yarn, getting it back, washing it, putting it up in Hanks, and selling it and supporting her local farm industry because she knows if she doesn't, <coughs> eventually those folks will disappear. We, we will be missing this amazing um, wool. This is Corydale and Border Lester, and it's really, really soft. So if you are interested in feeling this, uh, we, we have it here, you can take a look. But, so as a yarn shop owner, you know, as, as Jeannie has said, ask questions of where's the wool coming from, how's it processed, who's doing the work, get information, share that with your customers. But you don't have to make your own yarn, like Andrea, that's a bit ambitious. But you can do a <laughs> trunk show with local farms, ask them to come in and talk about their fiber from their, their flocks, and, and get that connection going. Go to fiber festivals if they're near you, and seek out local farms, and maybe you can't carry their yarn year-round, but you can do a pop-up shop for them or a, a trunk show. And they will love that exposure and coming in and, and connecting with your customers. And your customers will love connecting with them. Um, you know, we're supposed to be quick and we want to answer questions. So this is the dog. And so there's our fluffy wool. Near time here. That's our yarn waste. And I'm in booth 623 with American U yarn, which is all made from Shaniko Wool Company. And it's spun at Meridian Millhouse, which is next to us. And again, I couldn't do that and, and provide a wholesale product to yarn shops. And when I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm a small farm, I could never do this on a large scale without having a consistent, efficient source. And Jeannie's Shaniko Wool Company, her vision has created more opportunities for people to take really good locally grown and certified under responsible wool standards to create yarns, to create a different vision for your shop. So talk to Indie Dyers. They can get Shaniko Wool. Other people can do what I'm doing. And you know, there's, there's opportunities out there to you know, stretch that envelope and, and push and find local sources and really good wool that you want to use again and again and again. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> Diane. Okay, can you hear me? I don't know if I'm mic right. Yeah. Hello? Check, check, check. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm here to talk about the other uh, natural fiber, and that's cotton. And until the Industrial Revolution came along, and there was massive amount of production, uh, planting and production of cotton that the Industrial Re Revolution brought on, cotton was cultivated alongside food all over the world. It, 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 it's a really hardy and adaptable plant. And remarkably, uh, the cultivation and techniques of spinning and weaving cotton developed independently in communities isolated from each other. In India and in Africa, throughout Asia. I think I have a next. It's on the right. Yeah. Good. yeah. Um, in, in, in the Americas. Um, and the commonality, they all, it was, they all inhabited this band uh, around the Earth, and it's about 37 degrees north of the equator and 35 degrees south. And they were sophisticated uses of cotton by the Aztecs, the Incas, the Navajos, uh, people of the Caribbean, Middle East, India, and China. So it, it was really a vibrant and expanding um, world of cotton. And despite all the diversity, all these, uh, con across all these continents, cotton production always remained small scale and focused on the household. And that is what we have tried to do with our business, Appalachian Baby, is be small scale and family focused. That, that's, that's the, the, uh, the basis of our business. Um, so we, we get our yarn from uh, Texas family farms that grow it organically. Um, right now, Organic cotton represents 1% of global cotton production. And the balance is grown using pesticides, herbicides, miticides, and petroleum-based fertilizers. And in the, in the US, um, over the last five years, the total annual US cotton acreage was between 11 and 14 million acres. Um, in, in that same period, uh, about 40 to 50,000 acres were organic cotton. So that represents 0.4% of U.S. cotton total. So under the umbrella of the Texas organic cotton, yeah. so this, they have, this will start, yeah. Um, there's about 40 farm families that grow cotton organically in the heart of West Texas, and it's called, known as the, the world's largest cotton patch. The climate, they are, the winter temperatures are cold enough to limit insects and, and sunny enough to allow for mechanical weeding. And the the, these organic cotton farmers are committed to sustainable practices, mm -hmm. despite a lot of unknowns with ranching and farming, and, and particularly um, uncertain rain conditions. Um, e in each of the cotton that is marketed by the, the cooperative is traced by the name of the farm, and we, we, every bale we have, we can trace it back to the farm. Um, so then we, we use, uh, we process um, the cotton with, uh, with a third generation 
a cotton mill in North Carolina that started right after World War II. Um, and you can see their equipment. And then we dye it uh, at Meridian. Um, and Meridian has Meridian has made huge investments in uh, technology, um, equipment that has made uh, it really the, the most sustainable dye house in, in the, on the globe. And they, they re they've re significantly reduced water consumption and chemicals. Um, and they use less electricity and natural gas with these new, this new equipment and software they, they use to manage their dye house. Diane, just one more minute. Okay, Thank and you. then I'm just about done. So we try to make, you know, we aspire to be sustainable in all aspects, including our packaging, which we use compo compostable bags. And, and then, you know, with our designs, we try to offer things that are timeless, and will be passed on for generations. So your little Ivy dress sweater, the baby blanket, you know, could be passed on to her little brother. Oh, um, no. <laughs> 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 all right, so I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you all, everyone. Uh, I know that you've been very patient, audience members, and I. I promised you we would give an overview and circle back to you for some questions. And um, I know our time together is, is short. So I'm going to, in, in interest of the time, turn to you all and say, what would you like to explore with this amazing wealth of talent here on the stage? What are your questions? Is it more about third party? Is it traceability? Is it soil health? Is it packaging? I see a hand in the back. Let's go for it. There may be a microphone coming um, or yell, and we'll work on that. They're going to have to run back and forth with that mic. Yeah, he's got one. Question <laughs> from the floor. Hello? Yes. All right. it, it works. Oh, my, mine uh, is actually more of a comment. Uh, I'm, I'm so inspired by all you ladies because uh, I'm a stay-at-home mom and I love my career as an urban planner. Oh, wow. And I just really can't leave it behind. But I've, I've always, been, uh, my family has always been in um, handmade business. And now that I'm a mom, I've, it, it's like, it's, full, full blown um, hand making. And knowing that I can bring in as, as now as a business person and an artist, and I can bring in my urban planning and it just, it's it so inspirational how you Senator um, were able to pull in the local community, bring in the different groups to, to create a product that is helping the community and people interested in in um, in wool making. So I'm just so happy to be here, and thank you for the work that you're doing. And it's a, such an inspiration for me to that knowing that I I don't have to leave um, community development, or urban planning, or sustainability behind, but bring it in and pull in other people as business as a business person. We're we're creating economic development and helping the communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, any other questions or right comments there. from from the floor? Where? Right there. Yes, lights right in my eye, please. And you are? Uh, hi, my name is Emily Byers. I'm uh, owner of Fillory Yarn in San Jose, and I have a question about third party certi certification. Um, there's a lot out there of just acronyms of companies, Ocotech, or like this one that you were speaking of, Re Responsible Wool Standard. Uh, how do we find scams? And also, how do we find companies that are 
eco-friendly, but maybe don't have the money to spend to become eco-certified in some way. Okay, we'll have to have the mic. We're gonna need our microphone back for that. I'm good. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm working. Oh, okay, thank great. you, Emily. Okay, go for it. Um, there are really very few actual third-party certifications. Um, I happened to get invited to New York to the Hudson Valley Textile Summit, and we had four programs lined up side by side that presented to a group of legislators. And I think it was pretty clear when you go through that process that um, the actual third-party certifications go with programs like organic certified, where there is a third-party certification, the responsible wool standard is one of a group of standards developed by Textile Exchange. Textile Exchange is a global nonprofit that has built these standards with a broad group of stakeholders, which involve land um, in, um, nonprofits in land conservation like the Nature Conservancy, animal activist groups like Four Paws, as well as brands, grower groups, and other nonprofits. When you have that kind of stakeholder involvement and a three to four year development before a standard comes and then it uses credible third parties certification bodies to implement you're going to have something that's not a do-it-yourself form that you send in and get the permission to make a marketing claim on your product so that's why i say dig behind um, there aren't that many actual third party standards there's a lot of programs, but they're not truly standards. So I don't know if that helps helps you. And we will have time after our panel ends that um, I have a flight soon, but not that soon, that we we'll can all there. hang around a little longer. Just we'll have to clear the stage in, in a few minutes. Uh, other questions or comments? Yes. So I work for a manufacturing company in Texas, and we make non-woven textiles. What? So we, we wait, make- Wait, I didn't hear you. I work for a manufacturing company in Texas. We make non-woven textiles. Okay. So we service the automotive industry, mm -hmm. industrial, equine, yep. but we are, my uh, area of expertise and what I do is the craft and retail division, which is primarily batting for quilting. Okay. So, um, we do buy almost all of our products in the U.S. We know exactly where they come from, but we are not able to share that with the end user because it is part of our intellectual property. There are very specific products being made for us, designed for us, to give us very specific outcomes. So I just wondered if you have anything you know, to, to maybe address that. Um, and, and if anybody does sell things like cotton and wool in bulk, um, I would love to know the sources because there may be times when we are looking for additional suppliers. Um, so in our case, we do want to buy locally. We do want to be as sustainable as we can be. We recycle everything that comes out as scrap. <laughs> we put back into something. It may not be batting. It may be a different product that we make. Um, but again, it's a challenge for us because disclosing where we get things would, would affect right. our, our I, product. I've offer. heard on the shop floor just the today or yesterday, uh, several vendors, um, when asked this traceability question, say, we are not able to disclose either because of intellectual property or, or some unique partnership that they don't want um, impacted or the fear, and this just blew me away, the fear of negative action against yes. a farmer. Absolutely. So company says, I get my wool from here. Next thing you know, the farmer has people in costumes and carrying signs showing up to protest on cheering day. Yep. And yeah. for that reason, they won't disclose which farms they're getting their I'd fibers from. I'd like to speak from. to this. Good, Can thank I? you. Yeah. So that's a great issue and a great concern. It's another reason why I really like the standards that Textile Exchange has brought. For one, they're global benchmarks, but they flex. And I have watched numerous examples since 2016 when I first became, our family ranch was the first ranch in the world to achieve responsible standard certification. And I have watched this standard over the last seven, eight years flex with cultural and regional 
and national differences, but they allow for anonymity for the farmer and rancher. So for instance, um, only the certification body, which sends an auditor, and um, will know the actual name of all the ranches. So what they're trying to do is meet both concerns. You have the credibility of this oversight and these audits, but an individual farmer or rancher has the right to remain anonymous. So I have 10 ranches in my farm group, which is the only one in North America meeting RWS certification in Nativa region. One of those 10 does not want to be named. They just don't want to. There's a lot of farmers and ranchers that feel that, first of all, we have a, a large anti-animal animal, anti -animal agriculture contingent in this country and globally. So you don't want to become a target. You know, you don't want an extra. Although we are all have a target anyway, and I think that by being part of this program where we meet the leading standards developed by this broad stakeholder group, we can stand stronger together. I'm going to have more support if someone shows up at our ranch gate than I did all through those early years of building my business. In starting in 99, taking my harvest direct to market, I'm stronger today than I've ever been. So, but a rancher has a right to remain anonymous but what does it do for them? They still have the pride for their family and their workers of being part of a leading standard. They get the 20 to 25% premium. The farm group does the heavy lifting of that certification for them. And so then their life carries on, but they don't necessarily want to be on your website and be that poster child. They have that, they have that, that right. And yet, their wool is part of a group of wool that meets those certification standards. Now that I'm part of Nativa Regen, that company has invested in blockchain technology. So a user, a manufacturer, the buyer of that fiber can follow it in real time through this entire supply chain and watch your product going to completion, but only you can log in and see that, mm. never the consumer. So. Um, I think there is a mix of transparency, yet protection for farmers and ranchers built into these credible standards that helps everybody from the farmer rancher to the consumer in that we're all building something together that is more likely to have a positive impact to the planet. Uh, any, other, any other questions here? Yes. Hi, can you differentiate if there, or say if there's a difference between Nativa um, versus, like is Shanico yarn produced outside of this Nativa? Uh, can you Shanico that? wool is a wool supply. So it expands on what I began much like everyone here. So, um, <coughs> you know, I started taking our own ranch's harvest in 1999 and built that. And I used every piece of it. Shorn wool became product. The lamb went to local restaurants. The skins were being thrown in the garbage. I brought the skins home and cured them and created textiles. And every time we took a step with those skins and it created waste, we repurposed the waste into the next product, clear down to fabrics and paper. Shanico scales that and involves more ranches. We meet RWS certification and we now meet Nativa Regen certification. But those are just certifications. Shanico wool moves into the supply chain at scouring and combing and then out to mills to become yarn. And I'd like to make a shout out, as I think you guys have done, to Meridian, because um, they've really taken a position of investing both in American fiber in stock in their warehouse to be ready to make yarns with American fiber that meet these standards, but also custom make and, su well, support the craft industry. Mm -hmm. They create and stock yarns that supports the craft industry. I think that's a really good point for you all as shop owners to be asking when you ask about the supply chain, 
to say, so what was its journey? Where was it scoured? Where was it carded? Where was it spun? Uh, one thing that my customers have asked me to do is buy the combed top. So they have the comb tops from Jeannie's, Shiniko, blended with their own wool, if they have a small clip of Romney or, or whatever, they want me to still be buying it as comb top and adding it even to their farm's clip or to small brands. So it's, it's everywhere in the supply chain. And I agree, we, it's uh, too bad Meridian is not, we should have invited them too because they're a real big piece in the supply chain right. al along the way. I know our time here is, is short, uh, but um, I would certainly like to add, have any more questions um, from anyone who has one. Peggy would like to make a comment too. Uh, I okay. just want to make a comment just from you know what we're all looking at here. So I think there's come a time when I think all of you as consumers really know you're in charge. So you have the ability to learn that when you either go into a department store, go into a local yarn shop, go to your grocery store, and you can actually see the supply chain if they're willing to give it to you. As a consumer, if you educate yourself, and you're doing that today, I mean, you're avid knitters, you only pick the good stuff. And even when you're here today, look at where it's made. Is it one ply, is it two ply, is it super wash? You know, um, if it isn't, you know, any kind of petro or petroleum ingredients in it, you might, have an opinion about that. So, and that's what's helped me even when I started my journey in 2009, which was really how it started was through the grant and realizing that you, you want to actually, for your own self, have that information so you can, you know, make clear choices and you won't shop in the big box stores ever. You won't because you'll know the truth. Thank you, Peggy. Uh, any other any other questions or comments from, from our audience? Well then, I know we've gone over our time and I believe our next panel is, is here to take the stage and um, so we'll let them have it. And thank you all for coming and panelists for being here uh, with us today. Thank you.